Our text this evening is Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 to 11. We're reading from the English Standard Version. Paul writing, and he says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Our subject this evening is Paul's phobia. Paul's phobia. Paul says in verse 11, I am afraid. I am afraid. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your love for us. Lord, sometimes we sing and sometimes we say that you are our only hope. Sometimes it's just a cliche, but nothing could be more true. Vain is the help of man. Vain is the help of man, not necessarily because men are wicked. Sometimes with the best will in the world, men fail. They really desire to do good. We just were singing a while ago, he promised never to leave. Well, many persons have promised never to leave and they have left. But your promise is a different promise because you back up every single one of your promises. You are able to keep all your promises so when we sing, he promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. The important word there is the first word, he. He promised. Who promised? You. And it is impossible for you to promise and not keep it. Help us tonight, Lord, faithful God to teach your word faithfully, to listen to your word and to live it out faithfully. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. In previous lessons, we have noted that in verse 38, Paul begins his appearance Appeal, sorry, in verse 8, Paul begins his appeal to the believers in Galatia to forsake legalism, the legalism that they have turned to, and to return to a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He reminds them that before they were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that they were enslaved to gods who really were no gods at all. They had no existence. No existence except in the corrupt imaginations of those who worship them. In verse 9, he writes, but now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless 
elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more. The phrase, as we noted last week, the phrase, you have come to know God, is a reference to salvation from a human perspective. You have come to know God. That is how we speak. We have come to know God. While the phrase, to be known by God, is a reference to salvation from God's perspective, from heaven's perspective. Looking at the incarnation, God becoming a man, the Son of God becoming a man from a human standpoint. We say he was incarnated or he became a man when the angels, when heaven looks at the incarnation, heaven says he emptied himself. He emptied himself. So, and when Paul looks at it, he, he, he emphasizes God's perspective, heaven's perspective. God knowing us rather than us knowing God. You notice he said, now that we have come to know God, or rather that God knows us. If God had not first chosen and known us, we could never have chosen and known him. And we said that the word translated know and known, those, those two words, the Greek word is genosko, which means to learn to know, to come to know, to get a knowledge of, to become known. The word refers to experiential knowledge, not merely to the accumulation of known facts. The idea is of knowledge that is experiential, personal, and intimate. God's knowledge of the Galatian believers was experiential, personal, and intimate. And the same was true of their knowledge of God. Let me just show something to you. Um, earlier, when um, she started the prayer meeting, Sister Thomas read from Isaiah 46, verse 4. And, and I want to read verse 4, but I want to read from verse 3. And, and it, it's the first, as I sat there and heard her reading, it. I know I have read it before, but you know how the word of God is. Sometimes you might have read it a hundred times, but it has this newness about it. So when I heard her read it, I said, wow. Listen to verse 3. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been born by me from before your birth. Understand that? who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb. Even to your old age, I am he, and to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made, and I will bear, I will carry, and will save. Thus, Intimate knowledge, that's experiential knowledge, that's personal knowledge. He's not lumping us all together as a group. He's saying, that's how I deal with every individual that I save. I've known you for a long time. I've been carrying you before you were born. I've been carrying you in my mind and in my heart. And since you were born, I've been literally carrying you. So in light of this, Paul's question is particularly poignant. 
How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? How is that possible? That's what the Greek word translated how means. How is it possible? Paul was flabbergasted. It was very difficult for him to conceive of such a thing happening. A believer who had been rescued from abject slavery to demons in a pagan religion, returning to a human system of bondage. Paul says, how is that possible? After you have come to know God, or rather, after God has known you? Paul says that they were turning back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world. When Paul speaks of these elementary principles as being weak and worthless, he's describing their absolute inability to accomplish and grant what the grace of God is able to accomplish and grant. They are weak because they have no power to rescue unsaved human beings from condemnation. And they are worthless because they are unable to bestow any spiritual blessings. And as a consequence, because they can't bestow any spiritual blessings, they provide no help in conquering the evil desires that dwell in the heart of every human being. Incredibly, as again we said last week, Paul indicates that these Galatian believers actually wanted their desire to be enslaved again. That's kind of tough to grapple with, you know, but when you understand the Adamic nature that dwells in each of us, remember the song, Robinson's hymn, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. That's in all of us, you know, brothers and sisters. And have you ever found yourself reading the history of Israel and saying, how could they allow this to happen to them? Them people, yeah, eh? not realizing that it is you, it is me. Paul says, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? That word want is a translation of the Greek word ethelo, which means to be resolved or determined to purpose, to desire, to wish, to be like to like, sorry, to do a thing, be fond of doing, to take the light, to have pleasure. W.E. Vine says that a fellow does not simply express a desire, but a determined and constant exercise of the will. That's telling us something about our Adamic nature, you know. That word, ethelo, want, our desire is in the present tense, indicating that the Galatians were continually desiring to be enslaved again. They were not being forced to go back into slavery. They were willfully turning from truth to error. No wonder Paul was so bemused, outraged, and saddened. He asks how they could turn back again and be in bondage to a viewpoint of justification by works that was as weak and worthless as the elements they had worshipped and been enslaved to before they were saved. But again, remember how often Israel would say, we remember the flesh pots in Egypt when we sat down and had more than enough to eat. 
we were so happy. We didn't have a problem. And now you have come, you and your God, and you have taken us away from that happy state. You remember when God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush? Before God spoke to him, by the way, the writer says that they cry to the Lord by reason of the bondage. They cry to the Lord, Lord, deliver us. And the Lord said, I have heard the cry of my people. I have seen their affliction. And now these same people are saying, let us go back. And here is how we reason, at least this is how we used to reason. These people didn't have the Holy Spirit. You remember that? Can we be honest that that is how we used to reason? The only problem is that we claim that we have always had the Holy Spirit, but backsliding is still in our hearts. With all the speaking in tongues, we still are prone to wonder. In verse 10, Paul speaks of the way in which this turning by the Galatian believers from Christ and the authentic gospel to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world was being manifested. How do I know that you are turning back to unprofitable things? You observe days and months and seasons and years you notice Paul didn't say you're committing adultery? Are you stealing? Are you committing homosexuality? Paul says you are worldly. He didn't say you're going to Carib cinema, you know, or a little theatre, or AC Marriott. Some of us think those things are sinful. I don't. But that is not what Paul is saying. Look what Paul is saying. It sounds so innocent -y. What could be wrong with this? And later, we are going to see that Paul says, I'm afraid for you. Why, Paul? You're observing days and months, and seasons, and years. Think a good thing that? No. No. Brethren, we need to ask the Lord to drive out our mind, drive out of our minds the thought that the only sins are the so-called big sins that we think of. There are some things that indicate backsliding more than adultery and fornication. I hope you don't go away and say, Pastor said that it's all right for us to commit adultery and fornication. The Galatian believers were becoming religious ritualists again. You see, the subtlety of this new ritual, you know, is that they were religious rituals to pagan gods that were no gods at all. These rituals that they are involved in now are connected 
to the true and living God so they are more seductive. They have a stronger grip on you because you say, I'm doing this now for Yahweh, for Jesus. When you're really doing it for yourself. The presence of the Judaizers in Galatia makes it likely that the days, months, and seasons, and years which the Galatians were observing were those which the Mosaic law required Israel to observe. This is made clear by Paul's statement in verse 21, where he asks, tell me, you who desire to be under the law. He's talking now about the Mosaic law. Do you not listen to the law? Paul is saying, you desire, you want to be under the law now? The days, that word days probably refer to the Sabbath days and to the feasts which were observed just for a day. How many Sabbath miracles are recorded in the New Testament that Jesus did? Can anybody tell me? How many Sabbath miracles are recorded in the Gospels that Jesus did? Seven. Seven. Seven Sabbath miracles. What is significant about the seven Sabbath miracles? Let me tell you what is significant about them. The Jews permitted a person to consult with a physician on the Sabbath day if they were critically ill, as we would say in Jamaica, if they were undying. You could see a doctor if you were dying. But if your hand was broken, no, wait until after the Sabbath. None of the seven Sabbath miracles that Jesus performed had anything to do with critical illness. So there was a man who had a withered hand. A withered hand not going to kill you. Jesus didn't have to wait until the next day, no. Just for sunset. He could just have said to the man, listen, I realize that you have a problem and I want to help you. But we don't want to disturb these people and their rules and regulations, their extra biblical rules that they have set up. So just meet me at Avenue D. Ten minutes after sunset and I will straighten you out. Another man had been sick for 38 years. You think a few more hours would have made that man any worse? You think if Jesus had said to him, give me six hours and I will sort you out and you will never come to this pool again. You, think, you don't think the man would have been happy to wait. What is Jesus doing? He is deliberately coming against their rules and regulations, deliberately provoking them with no reason. Well, not without reason, sorry. I take that back. With very good reason. But, but not that these persons needed him to do that. What he was, he was making a statement, I couldn't care less about your man-made rules and regulations. I am here for people, not for rules. I wonder what we are here for. We're not talking about biblical principles, you know. We're talking about what man has said. The Galatians wanted to go back under that system. Paul says, I'm afraid of you. It is really one of the saddest verses in the Bible, in you know, verse 11, that we're going to come to. It's extremely sad. And, and I didn't know the implications of it until I studied it. 
to pre- pre- as I was preparing this lesson. The months refer to the monthly recurring events or to the seventh month spoken of in Numbers 29. The reference also could have to do with the celebration of the appearance of the new moon mentioned in Numbers 10, 10 and Numbers 28, 11. Now all these days, months, seasons and years were established by God, you know. God established them. But God established them for Israel, not for the rest of the world. For Israel. Seasons refer to the celebrations, not limited to a single day, such as the Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles. Seasons. Years is probably a reference to the year of Jubilee or the sabbatical year. The Galatian believers were exchanging a pagan religious calendar for a Jewish religious calendar. First, it was the days when we set aside to worship Zeus and Hermes. Now, is the days that we set aside to worship Jehovah. Those kind of persons are always the worst, you know. I know it personally because of my own life, you know. It's always the worst state to be in. Remember when Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, some of you say, I am of Paul. Some say, I am of Apollos. Some say, I am of Peter. And some, some say, we are of Christ. It's the worst said that. The biggest hypocrites are those, we are of Christ. We follow Christ. Wicked. Paul says, you're observing days and months and seasons and years. The word observe is a translation of a Greek word which means to stand beside and watch. To watch assiduously, observe carefully, to keep scrupulously, to neglect nothing requisite to the religious observance of. So the word denotes careful, scrupulous observance and intent watching lest any of the prescribed days, months, seasons, and years be overlooked. The Greek word is in the present tense, indicating that the Galatians were continually observing these Old Testament regulations assiduously in order to ensure that they neglected nothing that was required. A merely legalistic or ritualistic system of religion always promotes meticulous attention to external observances. Everything is about the externals. Commenting on this verse, Warren Wearsby makes the following remarks, and I quote, Does this mean that it is wrong? for Christians to set aside one day a year to remember the birth of Christ, or that a special observance of the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost or the blessing of the harvest in autumn is a sin? Not necessarily. If we observe special days like slaves, hoping to gain some spiritual merit then we are sinning. But if, the obser- if, but if in the observance we express our liberty in Christ and let the Spirit enrich us with his grace, then the observance can be a spiritual blessing. The New Testament makes it clear that Christians are not 
to legislate religious observances for each other. Romans 14, 4 to 13. We are not to praise the man who celebrates the day, nor are we to condemn the man who does not celebrate. But if a man thinks he is saving his soul or automatically growing in grace because of a religious observance, then he is guilty of legalism. So if you and I think that our fasting is going to make God say, what a precious soul he, I am going to have to do something extra. Angels, I was thinking of giving him a little mansion, you know. But you see this fasting, let us put on an extra wing for him. You see the troubles that we were going to bring upon him to test his faith, we're not going to do it anymore. Because obviously he's already strong. Look at his fasting record. I was wondering if he was going to make it, you know. But you see, this fasting that he's doing, we're going to give him a little tick that when we're looking over the record, we say, put him above somebody else because he's trying more. Don't look at me like Alice in Wonderland. That's how we think many times. We're not going to talk like that. We wouldn't be bold enough to say it, but our confidence many times is in these observances. Paul says that is sin. Because when you and I do that, we are saying, Jesus, you lied when you said it is finished. Paul did not object to these religious observances per se, for he himself observed them as a Jew. Remember that Paul was hurrying in Acts chapter 19 and 20, he was hurrying to go to Jerusalem for Pentecost, for the feast. He objected to Gentiles observing them as a means for salvation. That's what the Galatians were doing, you know. That's why if you think when Paul says, if a person preaches any other gospel than the one we preach, let it be a curse. If you think he was talking about Acts 2.38, you miss the whole, you, you miss the whole meaning of the letter. He's talking about a works-based gospel, which would include tarrying for the Holy Spirit, because that is works. Paul would have objected even to Jewish Christians observing these rules and regulations if they were doing it, thinking that they would be justified in the sight of God by doing it, thinking they would be somehow earning merit points with God if they did it. Nowadays, you know what I, is happening to me? Even when I find myself doing something that could be considered praiseworthy, the Holy Spirit is reminding me, you only do that because of me, you know. It has nothing to do with you. Now, Paul is not telling us anything that he's not very, very, very acquainted with because Paul was a former Pharisee and he knew all about this. How do we know? Well, in chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, he had written, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently 
and try to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Paul was saying, everything that these guys are doing, them are baby to me. In my days, them couldn't stand with me or me used to deal with it. I was so zealous that I was even killing Christians. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 to 6, he writes the following concerning his pre-conversion religious experience, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. No, no, Paul is, Paul is not boasting, you know. Paul is saying, as far as the righteousness that the law can provide, there was nobody better than me. That's what he's saying. So much so that there are commentators, I don't believe this, but there are commentators who believe that Paul was a rich young ruler, you know. I don't believe that. But the rich young ruler said, all these things I've observed from my youth. Paul says, blameless. If you check me by the righteousness that is in the law, you couldn't find a fault with my life. If you check me by the righteousness of Christ, then I'm a failure. Paul, as these passages clearly indicate, was well acquainted with the meticulous care with which the Pharisees kept all the appointed fees and the other rituals of the Mosaic law. It grieved him sorely to see these Gentile believers being drawn into the net of the Judaizers and enslaved by the formal, lifeless, legalistic lifestyle that he now considered so weak and worthless. One commentator has made the following observation, I quote, God had given Moses the law for Israel, and it was to identify them as his special people. And as his special people, there were certain ways they had to live and act and eat, and even certain things that were forbidden, like going into a Gentile home. It wasn't the moral law. The moral law is simply a reflection of God, God's character, and that is everlasting and eternal. When Christ came, the law was done. Its role was over. Now there was neither Jew nor Gentile, but all are one in Christ. So God is not identifying a certain nation or nationality of people by external behaviors and ordinances and events. That was the shadow. That was the ABCs. That was elementary school. Now Christ has come and we go from shadow to substance from elementary school. We graduate into the school of discipleship with Christ. End of quote. Paul is saying, which student graduates from high school and decides to go back to primary school? That is what Paul is saying to them. That makes sense to you? That's how stupid it was in Paul's eyes, you know. You graduate from Woolmers. Where else? Christine, you know that. It must be Woolmers. Kim, where else could it be? Nathan, where else could it be? Michael, where else could it be? 
have to be Wilmers. You graduate from Wilmers, I want to go back to St. Aloysius, to St. George's, to Jesse Ripple. Who does that? It is apparent from chapter 5 and verses 1 to 3 that the Galatian believers had not yet fully embraced the entire Mosaic law. For they had not yet submitted to circumcision. We can see that from what Paul writes. He says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. So it seems as if they had not embraced the entire law. But maybe that was because of the strategy of the Judaizers. Perhaps the Judaizers had cleverly refrained from presenting the more offensive requirements of the Mosaic law to the Galatian believers and had only introduced to them the aspects that would appeal to their religiosity. Like the celebration of feasts and the observation of other special days seeing that they had wholeheartedly embraced these, the Judaizers were now urging them to adopt circumcision and other more onerous aspects of the law. Because they wouldn't first go and say circumcision. Because for a big man to be circumcised is a problem, you know. You see what I'm saying? It's not such a pleasant thing. I don't think it was pleasant for the eight-year-old baby, but at least the eight-year-old baby don't really know where I'm going. Eight days, eight days, sorry. Thank you, eight days. The eight days old baby don't really know what is happening. But the big man now, well, if you take him and do that, that kind of rough. Ladies, you wouldn't understand. So I think it might have to do with how the Judaizers were so clever in presenting their doctrine. Let me just say something to you. I really do have no confidence in the church, you know. I have confidence in the God of the church. I am kind of watching history repeating itself. I'm watching history repeat itself in many ways. You know who supported Hitler overwhelming, overwhelmingly at the start of his regime? The churches. The churches, the churches were fully behind Hitler. Now I just look at the United States and watch this man that all the churches are fully behind. And he's saying some of the very same things that Hitler said. It couldn't be, it, if you, if you, if you, it's almost like it's a playbook, but and I, there's a famous saying, history has taught us that history has taught us nothing. And I'm just watching it again. What did the, 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 Lutheran, the Lutheran pastor say? He was one who supported Hitler, you know. And he said, when they came for the communists, I did not say anything because I was not a communist. 
And when they came for the homosexuals, I did not say anything because I was not a homosexual. And when they came for the Jews, I said nothing because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was nobody left to speak for me. For the Haitians are eating cats and dogs. The sad thing about it, you know, brethren, is that pastors operate in the same way, you know. You have some, you have some pastors that are really hucksters, you know. They are just really populist leaders. They really don't care about people. They care about power. They don't really care about people, and so they'll make rules that are draconian, and they never evaluate the rules until one of their children gets into trouble, or until their wife gets into trouble, and they say, oh, okay, her hair start falling out now. What are going to do? Beware of these people. Beware of these people. That's all I can say. Now let's go to verse 11 before we close. Paul writes, I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. In verse 11, the reformer Martin Luther said of, these, of this verse, these words of Paul breathe tears. It's really a terrible verse in a sense. Paul had brought the gospel of the grace of God to these people and they had seemed to believe it. He had also taught them that their sanctification, their growing in Christ's likeness could only be accomplished by the same grace that had saved them. It was the same Holy Spirit who had regenerated them, who would empower them to live daily under grace and not law. It grieved him to see these Gentile Christians who had been set free from their slavery to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world being ensnared by the Judaizers into slavery again. The construction of this verse in the Greek gives the impression that the fear that Paul expresses about the future of the Galatian believers is one that may very well be realized. In fact, it appears as though he believes they have already been realized, at least in part. Paul was not concerned so much about his own interests or his seemingly futile labors. He was fearful with respect to the spiritual welfare of his beloved Galatian converts. They were the objects of his anxiety. Paul says, I am afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. It's a very serious thing, you know, because Paul believes in the eternal security of the believer. So what he's saying is, well, we'll come to it. The words, I fear, are the translation of the Greek word phobio, from which our English word phobia is derived. The word in the Greek means to terrify, frighten, to put to flight by terrifying, to scare away, to be struck with fear, to be seized with alarm. That's the word Paul used about how he's feeling. You know? 
this is no joke, brothers and sisters. Paul didn't say, I'm concerned. Paul said, I'm afraid. He didn't even say, I'm worried. He said, I'm afraid. Clearly, Paul fears that the worst has happened. He knows that the Galatians were observing religious times, and his fear is that his labor among them would be for nothing, which indeed would be the case if they continued in their legalistic observance of the Mosaic law. So we think this legalism, we think legalism is a, is a small thing. The Greek word translated labor. I'm afraid that I have labored over you in vain. Means to grow weary, tired, exhausted with toil or burdens or grief, to labor with wearisome effort, to toil. The idea is of laboring to the point of exhaustion. Paul says, that's how I labored among you, to the point of exhaustion. He said to the Corinthians, ye rather am I willing to spend and be spent for you. Though the more I love you, the less I be loved. You think gospel work is nice? Laboring to the point of exhaustion. The word is in the present tense, indicating the, the perfect tense, sorry, the perfect tense, indicating the thorough work of evangelism that Paul had done in Galatia. So Paul, Paul, Paul is not saying, I didn't labor well. Paul is not saying, there was something that I missed out. Paul is not saying, I I'm afraid that I didn't teach everything to you that you should have heard. He's saying, I'm just wondering if everything was in vain. It's serious, brothers and sisters. The word vain is a translation of a Greek word which means without success or effect, to no avail, to no purpose or in vain, having no real value or failing to achieve the desired result. Kenneth Weiss' expanded translation of the Greek New Testament renders the verse as follows. I am afraid about you, lest perhaps in vain I have labored to the point of exhaustion for you. John MacArthur states, and I quote, How sad for such a faithful servant of the Lord to believe that all the life-threatening, sacrificial service he had given in behalf of the people of Galatia was worthless. All the travel, illness, loneliness, struggles, even the stoning he received in Lystra that left him for dead was for nothing if they reverted to their old slavery. No wonder this is such an impassioned epistle. The thought of all that effort being void compelled Paul to write as he did. End of quote. See how Paul wrote, if any man preach any other gospel than that which I have preached unto you, let him be condemned to hell. That's how Paul starts the letter, you know. That's the opening sentences. Paul is saying, in effect, to the Galatian believers, I fear that I have wasted my time among you. Maybe you were not genuinely converted after all. Maybe everything I taught you just went in one ear right, right out the other ear. It never lodged. You never really received the truth. You never were changed by that truth. That's where Paul is, you know. But were you really saved? Incidentally, 
Incidentally, I want you to just think with me. Think with me logically. You think if Paul believed that speaking in tongues was the initial evidence that a person had received the Holy Ghost, and if all these people had spoken in tongues, do you think Paul would have asked this question? No, he would have said, I know that you were originally saved because I all heard you speaking in tongues. You will get it if you didn't get it now. When you start to think about it, you'll see what I'm saying. Paul is saying about people among whom he labored. I wonder if you guys are really saved. Serious, you know, brethren? This is not like Pastor Bartlett, you know. This is the Apostle Paul. Serious. Brothers and sisters, Paul expresses fear for those who profess to be believers, yet seek to find favor with God by legal observances. Even unsaved persons can observe days and months and seasons and years. It gives some people intense satisfaction to feel there is something they can do in their own strength to win God's approval. If Paul could write in this manner to the Galatians, what would he write to professing believers today who are seeking to be justified and sanctified through our own efforts? What would Paul write? Say when he sees persons claiming to be Christians who are taking oil and anointing their windows and doors and opening, putting a key in their Bible and opening it at Psalm 91 at their doorway. Who are you trusting? You observe days and times and seasons and years. Like I said on Sunday, your future under the stars. Some of you cannot go to work unless you hear that first. You are going to meet a tall, handsome stranger today. From once you leave your door, you're going to meet a tall, handsome stranger. Once you come out of your house, you're going to see a pretty girl. Nonsense. That is astrology. It is astrology. There's a difference between astrology and astronomy. Astronomy is the study of the stars. Not for the purposes of living your life for the purposes of, in fact, some, some great Christians were astronomers, like Galileo and Copernicus. Astrologers are those who deal with a familiar spirit. You have Christians that do that, you know. You have Christians that go to read up persons, you know. All these little, these little revivalist practices that are in many churches. <laughs> There's so much I could say, but I won't. Listen to what Paul writes in Colossians 2, 8 to 17. 
See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to what? According to human tradition. According to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. This is not a oneness scripture. I'm sorry. This scripture is saying to us, don't let anybody tell you anything that leads you to trust in anyone but Christ, because he is the head of all rule and authority. Don't let anybody put extra biblical rules on you. That's what he's actually saying to them, because Christ is the head of all rulership and authority. Do not submit to any pastor who is not submitted to the word of God. Do not submit to any pastor who is enjoining you to do things that are not enshrined in Scripture. If you do that, you are not following Christ. A man now has become your God. Aaron Neville said, tell it like it is. Some of you, you're listening to some songs, you know, how you laugh. I'm kidding. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. You see, brethren, this is, when, when you take a scripture like this and talk about the oneness, remove it, remove it from its context, you get into all kind of trouble. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made a life together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. It is what God had canceled and set aside, nailing it to the cross that the Galatians were picking up, you know. So that which was dead and buried, them dig it up. And decide that we go and follow this. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, because of all of this, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. When I was coming up, you had a song in Jamaica. If you run down your shadow now, you can never catch it. You ever try to do it? If you have the substance of something, brethren, why would you still be trying to catch for the shadow? It sounds ridiculous to us, just those examples, you know, but that is what we're doing when we go back to legalism, you know. It's, it's frightening. Uh, let me stay away. The false teachers in Colossae were passing judgment on the believers as to whether they were truly spiritual or not. They told the Colossians the lie that Jesus Christ was not enough, but they also needed to keep the Jewish ceremonial rituals as commanded in the Mosaic law. These false teachers used non-biblical criteria by which to judge the believers. In order to counter the lies 
of these adversaries of the truth, Paul presents the truth about the believer's position in Christ. That is what Paul do. Paul never argues about standards. Never. Paul says, this is what Christ has done for you. Because in Paul's mind, if I can get believers to understand what Christ has done for them, if I can get them to see what their position really is in Christ, they will be able to sort out how they live. Paul presents the truth about the believer's position in Christ. He argued that since they had been delivered by Christ from the evils which had surrounded them, and if they had been, since they had been freed from the observances of the law, they were not to allow anyone to sit in judgment of them or claim the right to decide for them in these matters. They were not responsible to human beings for their conduct, but to Christ, who is the head of all rule and authority. Let me tell you something, brethren. I believe, I believe that the word of God does the work of God in the people of God by the Spirit of God for the glory of God. I am not going to be a police officer. My authority is to feed the flock of God. Your authority is to work out what the Holy Spirit is working in you. A man came to Jesus one time and said, Master, tell my brother to divide the inheritance between me and him. And Jesus said, no, sir. I know that we come for do. If it's that you want, hire somebody else. That's not my role. This is what Paul means when he says, in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are, you are filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. I'm going to, how often have we concluded with Spurgeon? Eh? So we're going to conclude with him again. Spurgeon seems to always have the final word. Do not let anybody come in and tell you that it is necessary for your salvation that you should abstain from this meat or that drink, that there is a merit in fasting for 40 days in Lent, or that you cannot be saved without observing such and such a holy day. Your salvation is in Christ. Keep you to that and add nothing to this one foundation which is once for all laid in him. Do not put yourself under the bondage of any rules and regulations that may be made by men. If you choose to do anything or to abstain from something else because you judge it to be right and beneficial, do so. Christ is your only rule and leader. And if he does not command anything, let it not signify to you who does command it. If Christ don't command it, don't let nobody tell you to do it. That's what Spurgeon is saying. If you abstain from certain meats because they have been offered to idols and the consciences of others might be offended if you partook of them, do not act as though, uh, thus as though it would save you. Do not make yourself subject to the judgment of other men, for Christ is your lawgiver and Lord. Brothers and sisters, how many biblical commands are there 
Why should we want more than that? You tell me that. Let's start. Lord God, thank you for your word. I believe, Lord. I believe that your word does your work in your people through the agency of your spirit for your glory. We refuse to play the role of the Holy Spirit in the lives of your people. Help us to steadfastly maintain this position, Lord. There are those who make so much about the receiving of the Holy Spirit, even with certain accompanying signs. And yet, when that happens, the Holy Spirit is not allowed to control the lives of his people. Lord God, there is a temptation in all of us, in all of us, including myself, to behave in this way. There is something seductively powerful to have a church where everybody behaves the same way and dresses the same way and looks the same way. Help us to realize that such a church is not your will. It is your will for people who have received the Holy Spirit to be led by the Holy Spirit to form their own conviction to be guided by the Holy Spirit, to be superintended by the Holy Spirit. Lord, help me and all the other pastors who stand as shepherds in your church to faithfully preach and teach your word and leave you to sort out your people. We commit ourselves into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.